Welcome everyone to the Pennywise Podcast. I'm Terry Barr. So happy to be here with you today. We're going to be talking about money and the really important stuff, your personal finances today. How can we save a little? Whether you're working a lot or you know, it, it's a tough time right now. And that's why I'm so happy to welcome in. We have Lisa Rowan, now a personal finance expert with Forbes Advisor. Lisa, thank you for being here. Terry, thanks so much for having me. I'm looking forward to chatting about these things with you. Oh, we are too. We could use this kind of advice right now, which is incredible. Um, money saving, it's its hard right now. We're in 2021, I think we just want to put that one behind us. But now maybe some people are thinking a resolution or maybe that intention to save some money. Where do we begin? <laughs> <laughs> It really depends on your personal situation, because as you just mentioned, a lot of people are in circumstances that they didn't exactly expect to be in right now. We're entering the second year of the pandemic. You may have lost income last year or had to leave the workforce altogether, maybe lost your job, or you might be someone who was still able to work, maybe kept your own schedule, just move things at home. But now you're worried about money, right? Maybe it was this wake up call that you weren't exactly happy to have where all of a sudden you're thinking like, well, what would I do if I didn't have a job, if I didn't have savings? So I think a lot of people are now, you know, they're sort of on the defensive mode right now. They're thinking either I've got to get ready just in case something happens to me, or I've got to get back on track because I don't want what happened last year to happen again. So, you know, the first step is really to recognize your circumstances, accept the situation you're in, whether it's good or bad, and start making a plan to save because you have to remember that this is going to take time. And so you can't, you know, snap your fingers and suddenly it's going to be March 1st or April 1st, and you're going to have a flourishing emergency fund of several thousand dollars. You may have to break this down into baby steps into five or $10 a week, even five or $10 a month when you're getting started. So be prepared to have slow and steady growth. When we go into talking about budgeting, when we talk about saving, you know, I think everyone goes in with really high hopes, but you have to be realistic and know that this is not going to be an overnight change that's going to solve all your problems. Absolutely. Okay. So I'm doing one of those challenges, bring my jar out and show it to you, doing a dollar the first week, $2 the second week, the 52 week challenge. Is something like that a good way to maybe motivate yourself to actually try to do things right now? Yeah, this is a situation where you want to think about yourself and how your own psychology works. If you're a naturally competitive person, if you love to play games, if you love to win games, yeah. if you hate, you know, missing your chance to like, I'll give you an example. I um, use the Peloton app. I don't have the bike. I have the app. And right now I'm up to like 35 days straight that I've done a workout just on my TV at home. Now that I've got 35 days, I don't want to break my streak. Right. And it's similar in savings. It doesn't matter how, you know, what your exact method is, as long as it's something that you're going to keep up with. So if you're going to do maybe a 52 week challenge, you know, something where you put money aside on a schedule, you know, make sure that's something that you're going to be able to uh, uphold over the year, because you don't want to get to week five, you know, say, oh, I don't really feel like doing it this week. And then you've lost all your momentum, right? So if you're not a competitive person, maybe you need something that is a plan um, with maybe an accountability group or an accountability partner, or maybe you just need to set up recurring deposits into your savings account. Don't try to fight what your personality is not, you know, engineered for, right? If you're competitive, go the challenge route, uh, maybe dare some friends to do it with you. But if you um, aren't so competitive, maybe you can pick a different way that works. Okay. So you recently wrote a really great article about savings and, and savings accounts in particular, and what we should do when we're thinking about, okay, do I put my money into a savings account because the interest rates are not great? So what are our options? What this? What should we think about? Yeah, this is a really tough one because people who have been in the personal banking game for a while, basically anyone who's been an adult for more than five years 
remembers some really amazing interest rates on savings accounts. I remember getting 5% in a high yield savings account before the recession. My father just told me the other day about 14% he got on one back in the eighties. And I was just like, what, what is even that about? Right. And it just, it just blows your mind to think about how high interest rates used to be, but because we're in a tricky economy right now with the pandemic, interest rates are very low for savings accounts. And that goes for uh, a regular savings account at a regular bank or a high yield savings account, which is supposed to give you far larger returns, but they're all very low. The Federal Reserve is saying they're going to be low until about 2023 or 2024. That's going to be years ahead of earning somewhere between 0% and maybe half a percent on the money in your savings account. And that can ruin motivation for a lot of people because half the fun is seeing what you earn in interest on top of the money you've put in. It's like the money does the work for you. Mm. Instead, it's up to you to make those good choices, to put that money in. And think of it this way. A savings account is not a place where you're going to earn money. It's a place where you're going to keep your money safe. So think of it as your your safe vault for the vacation fund for next year, for the college savings that you're adding to, for your emergency fund, just in case you do have an income fluctuation over the next year. Uh, and, and think of it as that vault where you're, you're not going to earn a whole lot of money on that. You'll earn a couple of cents here or there. But your money is going to be safe at the end of the day. And if it takes away that temptation of you grabbing that money out and spending it and touching it, yes. like that's that's half the battle here. Can yeah. You, that's why I, what I have in my jar probably needs to go to a bank or what might even be a better option if a saving uh, attitude may not mean savings account. Well, I mean, you do have some options. Um if you're going on the super safe route, you could maybe just have a separate checking account where you keep money that you're saving for maybe a large purchase that you have, you know, ahead of you in the next couple of months. It's, it's not a big deal because you're not, you know, missing out on any earnings. Your other option on the other end of things, and I will caveat it from the beginning, you have to have your finances real tight. You've got to have a budget, an emergency fund. You need to be maxing out your retirement contributions before you do this. But if you have extra money, and you're not really sure what to do with it. You're saving it up for something down the road, but maybe you're not sure what it is yet. Or maybe that goal is five to 10 years down the road and you're really just like stashing money away. You could potentially open a brokerage account and invest that money. If you think about the return on a savings account, it's gonna be less than 1%. Historically, the stock market returns at least five, six, 7% per year. So even when the stock market sort of fluctuates as it did last year in the spring, it, it trends upward, right? So in the long run, you're going to earn something on the money that you contribute. The downside is that there aren't really tax advantages if you do this. Uh, it's unlike your 401k at work where it's pre-tax dollars. Uh, you might have some allowances for distributions if there's an emergency, um, but you know that money is, tucked away for retirement. And that's why you have those tax benefits. Rather a regular investment account, a brokerage account, you're not going to have any tax benefits that you're going to get. You're going to have to pay taxes on your earnings, but you can use that money whenever you want at any time. So you can draw from it. If you decide that y'all got your vaccines and there's a great flight to Hawaii, you can get on, like, go ahead, take the money out. Um, but this is definitely, um, you have to be ready to take a risk. Maybe this is for the truly competitive people among our listeners right now, yeah. um, that maybe they want to do some long-term investing in a dedicated investing account, but that is really like expert level after you've done all the basics that you should be doing for your budget. Well, that's what I was going to ask you. How do you know when you're ready? You know, some of us want to jump right into the pool. <laughs> Let's go yeah. and then disappointment sets in when things don't quite go the way we hope. How do you know when you might be ready to take that next saving step? Right. Like, for example, if you were looking at the whole GameStop scenario from a few weeks ago and you really think you missed out, well, if you only have 50 bucks in your savings account, you weren't ready to play that game, right? You need to know which which pool you should be in right now, if it's the kiddie pool, if it's the waiting pool, if it's the high dive. Uh, and so you have to think about your living expenses and being able to get by, first of all. Are you paying all your bills on time? Are you paying all your debt on time? Even though there are forbearance periods right now, for example, for student loans, 
you have to think about what happens when that ends. Do you have the money to cover when those payments start again or when those forbearance periods end? So you've got to be thinking about uh, what you need to do up front to just get by, to live as comfortably as you can. From there, it's time to think about an emergency fund. The number of what you're supposed to have in an emergency fund, it depends on who you talk to. The, uh, the general idea is to have three to six months worth of your expenses in a savings account. Not necessarily exactly what your income is for three to six months, but what you actually need to spend to get by during those months to pay your rent or your mortgage, to get food, to pay your bills. Uh, a good way to get started in the emergency fund if you're just getting started, I say aim for $1,000. You'd be amazed how much easier it gets to save after you've got $1,000 in that account because you look and you're like, I've got it made. This is great. This is wonderful. So start building towards $1,000 and then see if you can do you know, multiple months of what your expenses are. But that's going to vary depending on what you need in your life. After you've got an emergency fund and probably at the same time, if you have options available at work, I was talking about retirement accounts. So make sure if there's a 401k available through your employer that you're taking advantage of it because usually they will match part of what you contribute. That is free money, tax free from your employer that you can take advantage of and help your retirement savings grow exponentially over time. And then if you've still got money left over after that, open your own Roth IRA or a regular IRA, traditional IRA rather, uh, and start socking away some retirement money in there. We're living longer than ever before. You got to plan ahead. You want to have a good long life that is easy when you get to retire. So it, take care of those accounts, even though it's really hard to look that far ahead. Like we want the instant gratification, yeah. but it's really good to take advantage of those accounts. If you can access them, even if it's just $20 a paycheck to start that you're putting in while you're working on that emergency fund. That emergency fund comes up as, as far as something that is a should do. I think that mm -hmm. comes up more conversations than um, I've ever heard in the past. And do you think it ties back to of us have seen in the last year with, you know, people losing their jobs and not being prepared. We need to be prepared, unfortunately, don't we? Yeah, it's really easy to get comfortable when you have a job, when you know when the next payday is. And you may not be rich, but if you know that that pay is coming in regularly, it's so easy to get comfortable and say, I've got it all taken care of. But it's just a matter of, you know, something overnight could change. You can get hurt, you could get sick. So you need to be able to have a cushion available, even if you live on your own. It's just a matter of being able to take care of yourself if the worst case scenario happens. Uh, and I think that really came to light in the past year for a lot of people realizing how uncomfortable things were going to be. Maybe access to healthcare was a little tougher. Maybe we're sold out of toilet paper in the grocery store. And once you add more and more stressors into your life, you look for a place of comfort, a place where you know that you are prepared, you can take care of yourself. And that could be your emergency fund. And it's there for those times when you really need it. Okay, so we've got the idea of the traditional saving uh, account, mm -hmm. savings account which we know the interest rates are, mm -hmm. then we've got- Pretty uh, non-existent, yeah. <laughs> so then we've got um, emergency fund, which is really important. And then the other ideas that you suggested, that it almost sounds like a really good kind of step ladder in an approach to try to save in all the really good places you can. Yeah, and it, it's one of those things where you have to think about how your mind works when it comes to money. You need to start really small when you're looking at your money goals. If you launch into the remainder of 2021 and you say, I'm gonna put this much in my emergency fund and I'm gonna put this much in retirement and I am gonna have a brokerage account and I am gonna do this challenge. If you give yourself too much to do at once, you are going to fall flat on your face. You are going to make a miscalculation and you're gonna be so mad at yourself that it's going to ruin your ambition to succeed at this. So when it comes to making financial goals, whether it's a resolution or just, you're just turning a new page at any point during the year, it's really important to start small and build good financial habits that you can start stacking on top of one another. Maybe it's $5 a week automatically goes into your savings account that's tied to your checking account. And it's that simple and that low key. But by taking that decision out of your mind, it just automates it. It automates it. It makes it easier for you to just 
stay on track. It's one less decision you have to make, you know, it's done, you know, and, and then you start adding, you change it to $10 a week, or you open a dedicated high yield savings account for a trip you're planning to take, or, you know, to have a rent cushion. Um, and it's, it's really whatever you make of it. But if you start too big and you try to conquer all of your finances at once, you're just setting yourself up for disaster. So be really nice to yourself and start small. So you can start to see your wins. So everybody who wants to save money, raise your hand. Me. <laughs> I know. I told everyone that you were going to be terrific. This is Lisa. <laughs> Lisa is a personal finance expert with Forbes Advisor. Lisa, for people listening or watching, what is like the very first step? What can somebody do? They're, they're uh, motivated now by what you've said. What's that first baby step to get it all underway? The first baby, baby, baby step is to figure out what you're spending before it's a toddler. You got to think infant step here, right? Think about and find out what you're spending, not necessarily to judge you and say you should be spending less, but to get a picture of what your reality is right now. What are your expenses when it comes to your home, your car, your childcare, your education, putting food on the table, you need to have a picture of what those essentials are that you need to be able to take care of before you can even start thinking ahead for savings goals. Because if there's not money left over at the end of the month, after you pay all those bills, it's going to be a lot harder to find ways to save. So you've got to get a, a good picture of what you're looking at. Start just like making notes, do some back of the envelope math. If it, if it's too stressful to look at it all at once, just think about what you spent this week, then maybe go look at your bank statement to see if it matches up with what you think you spent. Right. Um, and start going through and thinking, okay, you know, Maybe, you know, for me, for example, I'm a renter, so I pay my rent every month. I know what that is, but what is the electric bill usually? And what is the water bill usually? And did my internet bill go up a couple months ago and I didn't update my budget? So just thinking through all of the steps and all of those obligations that you have, and then you can start planning ahead for whatever savings goal you want to put. Oh, great. One last question from me. Um, and I, this is one of my favorite questions always. You hope to leave this podcast with something for people to take away with them. What do you hope that is when this is over? Yeah, I want people to know that they can do this. They can save even if they think their circumstances or the odds are against them. But it does take time. You are not going to solve your problems overnight. Like I said, you are not going to suddenly have a big pile of money like Scrooge McDuck that you can dive into overnight. But if you can dedicate yourself to taking six months and seeing how much you can save or just making a plan for sustainable savings, small growth is better than no growth. So just take your time, understand that it's going to take a while. Saving is a marathon, not a sprint. And I promise you, if you stick with it, you will see the impact over time. And, you know, God forbid, if another pandemic or something like this happens again, hopefully you'll be a little bit more prepared than we all were this time last year. Oh, no kidding. Lisa, what a terrific conversation. Thank you so much. Hopefully, um, you and, and maybe even I together have inspired somebody to get to their savings underway this year, 2021, and probably never been a better time to start. Yeah, I agree. Terry, it was so great to be here. The pleasure was mine. And I really hope that your listeners enjoy this session. Thank you. Again, this is uh, Lisa Rowan. Lisa is a finance expert with Forbes Advisor. And I just want to thank everybody for listening or watching our Pennywise podcast. It's brought to you by Lee Enterprises, and we'll see you again next week.